All right. This, is not, this does not look professional at all. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, you're clearly in, in bed, uh, but that's, that's a fine. I'm in my bedroom. I'm, I, didn't, right. I didn't choose well, I to be in my bed, but. I don't have a desk in my, my room here. This is, a, I'm okay. on the road, Todd. <laughs> I've practiced a lot, so I'm on the road now. <laughs> Your right. practice has earned you that that hotel room, that, yes. <laughs> that bed better, you're laying in right now. <laughs> for better or worse, uh, every decision I've made in the practice room has led me here to the Stay Alfred <laughs> Hotel in Washington D.C. So, okay, well that's a great place to start. Um, Let's do it. Josh Quillen, welcome to How We Practice, a new video series hosted by Todd Meehan of Liquid Drum. Um, this is Casey Kasem. <laughs> yeah, you know I. Uh, uh, there was, I guess you sent a couple of texts begging mm -hmm. me to be on the series. And mm -hmm. so I was just finally, making sure that, that you had my phone number. <laughs> I was seeing all these other people. I was like, I just, I wonder, I mean, I didn't change my number, but. Uh, well, you did, you, you moved, you moved. So it could have, maybe like, maybe you got a new cell phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, I figured that maybe I didn't have it. So thanks for reaching out. Well, I am honored that you would consider me for this, Todd. <laughs> Given our past, I think we're going to call a truce here for the next uh, bit of time here. Yeah. But I'm honored you'd ask me to be a part of this. You know, um, uh, of course I'm interested in whether or not you practice. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> if so, how you go about doing that. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we start with, I thought uh, actually when we were exchanging some texts um, one of the interesting little uh, topics that you dropped in that was um, specifically what I would imagine would have been a very uh, busy and also um, necessarily methodical time of practice when you were um, uh, getting ready to, I guess, audition for So Percussion, the group you, uh, you now have some ownership in. Um, That's right. So why don't we why don't we start there? Why don't we uh, flashback flashback to whatever year that was, and um, we'll use that as a launching off sure place. Um, yeah. So uh, there I was, spring of two thousand six. Oh, six. Uh, no, Good yeah. Year. So this this would have been this would have been spring of two thousand six, um, my second year at Yale, and um, I don't know if you had a similar experience, but that was coming to Yale and studying with Bob was the first time I had had a teacher that knowingly and purposefully handed me more rep than any human being would be able to process at like a truly high level, like to really absorb it and learn it and really dig in. Like my, my, my process for practicing, whether it be prepping for a steel band gig at like a bar mitzvah or my junior recital was more of a process of dealing with like, four pieces that I was learning for this over the span of six months, you know, really digging in slow methodical practice, like over a long period of time and with absolutely zero performances of the piece until my recital. And I get to Yale and Bob gave me, you know, nine marimba solos and two multiple pieces and 18 chamber music pieces and said, I'll see you in three days, you know, and I expect to have every piece learned. It was just this absurd rubio you know, hurdle to jump that terrified me from day one um but it didn't i didn't really realize what bob was trying to do at that moment uh until basically like february of 2006 when i was looking to graduate um and was like about to enter the real world and i didn't have a job i was planning on doing my um artist diploma again I had auditioned for that and was like, well, if I don't get a job, this is what I'll do again. I'll just stay here and keep working. And got a very cryptic email from Adam Solinsky saying, you know, we have, would love you to play a few gigs. And then it wasn't Bob anymore handing me a ton of music. It was an employer. And I realized at that moment, I was like, oh, okay, this is why this is important because this sort of thing might come up. But it happened to be at the same time I was learning my grad recital stuff which was not in the real world and was not a monetary, like I wasn't paying my rent that way. So I was sort of had to juggle both. And um, I was learning, I think I was learning Mirage, Rogue Ashanti, uh, a new commission by Stuart Smith for Steel Drums and Voice, 
um, and Village Burial with Fire. And then, uh, so, and that alone, I think, to me felt like, well, that's a, that's a lot to chew and I'm going to do that. And then Adam handed me about three hours worth of rep for a tour in Russia, which was a completely different rep than what he needed. They needed me to do a look and listen, which was like so-called laws of nature and all this other stuff. And I kind of just, I remember Bob's telling me, well, you're going to figure it out because you have no choice. And that he's like, just take solace in that. Like you're going to, you have to do it. Like there's no way around it. This is, or you're just not going to have that work. And I said, okay. Um, one thing I feel like I was really good at, and I think this comes from my mom. Um, she's very methodical in terms of if she has a bunch of tasks to take care of. She would, she always kept a date book and she always like literally wrote out everything she had to do that day. Like from, you know, take these medications, make sure that your kids have done X, Y, and Z homework check to make sure that your husband you know whatever she was very thorough with her daily life and it was something I hadn't really had to do up until that point but I knew was in my familial DNA from my mom right so I just decided to employ the same technique so I got a big old piece of paper and I cordoned off the back room at Henry Hall at Yale I made a list of every piece I had um, how many days I had to learn it and then set a goal. So like I had 30 days to learn all the so-called laws of nature before the first rehearsal. So I was like, I knew that I kind of looked, I realized that if I just made a cheat sheet for the third movement, the actual skill set to play that movement wasn't that hard. So the hardest part was looking at all those notes and realizing like, Oh my God, this is just a really simple structure. Let's, if I make the cheat sheet, I only have to really practice that for about a day of those 30 days. Then the second movement was a little trickier, but there was a recording I could hear and I could practice along with. So I realized, okay, maybe I don't, I can play with so for a second on the recording, but not until I've learned it slowly and I can really just know the mechanics of my parts. So I set some goals there. The first movement was the hardest one. You know, like I, I couldn't practice with the tape. I had no idea what was going on and stuff was just flying by. So I was like, I need all 30 days of every day watering this tree so that by the end of the 30 days, I can walk on stage and not be terrified. Um, and so I just started from day one. I was like, I'm going to learn. I'm going to be able to play through the whole thing at quarter note equals 20. And that was easy. Like, right. it, it took me an hour and a half to do. Right. Like, when you play a nine-minute piece at one sixteenth the tempo or whatever yeah. it is, like, yeah. it takes you a long time. But I just, I adopted the mindset of, if I can play it really, really well, very slowly, and I just do it every time, the way my brain works is I'm not gonna perceive the gradual speeding up every day if I do it a click a day. Right. And so I just, or two clicks a day, whatever the math needed to be to make 30 days work out. By the end of the 30 days, I was raging at 100, you know, quarter equals 120 or whatever it is that so was playing it at the time. And there was some weird piece that came in that because I had set these goals that every day they were super easy to meet. All I had to do was find an hour and a half to play really easy music for an hour and a half. Right. When I met with So, it's like, well, now I'm playing really hard music in nine minutes. Right. But I've done this a million times. Like, I've driven this car for 30 days in a row at a slow speed, so I know how it handles a little bit, you know? Um, and then I had to do, but because I had set aside an hour and a half for the first movement, that meant I had to find more time for Rogashanti, which was for this other recital. So that room was just, I had every setup set up and I blocked off the time. And I think for about six months of my life, I was practicing probably eight to 12 hours a day. Right. And just like hammered away, get coffee, get food, call my girlfriend and then go back to practice and just cycle around those setups. Um, and at the time, it's like, I, I don't know if you've had this experience. It's like, you don't, you're not tracking necessarily that you're doing something crazy. Um, it's just, you're doing what you have to do. And uh, the thing I do, I, it did now for me in hindsight is my hands, I know what my hands can do. And um, it taught me a lot about the way I learn things. Um, I also, because I had set my goals so specifically and so low for myself every day, like it was the it was the, the 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 benefit of low expectations out of myself every day right meant that some days were better like i got through it and i was like well let's bump it up three clicks right and then 
you sort of like, you can adjust your investment portfolio over the course of the month based on how you actually did the prior day. Right. Um, as opposed to saying like, well, I got to learn the whole thing. Like I got to be able to play all these excerpts at this tempo by tomorrow or like, I'm never really, to me, that just felt terrifying. That felt like there's, that's an unachievable goal for me. Um, and luckily, I don't think it was luck. I think I knew that that was how I was going to process things. Other people in the studio, like Jamie Dietz, um, was in school with me there. He could sight read things way better than I could. And so, um, I knew that that was a weakness of mine, but I also knew that I didn't have time to fix that particular weakness in the amount of time that I had. Right. So I had to triage, I had to stop the bleeding in another way. And Jamie could learn things differently from me. Now that I'm in so, it's like, those things still exist. Adam is a better sight reader on some things than I am. I need more time. But, you know, when they're learning a steel drum piece, I can sight read that stuff. Right. They don't need to. Um, I came out of grad school having played my recital and felt great about it and then walked into the real world and actually playing gigs was way easier. <laughs> right. Like walking on stage, like, um, you know, just getting those at bats too sort of helped me learn about how I had, like I had learned some things wrong. The thing I didn't, like the, the thing you, I didn't get when I was learning the first movement of so-called laws, for example, the, the second side, the three, eight side, my particular what part did you play two or three uh three lawson replaced you right yeah. yeah yeah so like my particular part and i think your part probably does too if you just look at it and you're not playing with other people most of my stuff fell in a three eight bar but felt like two sets of three bugged right. bugged 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 and so when i learned it, i was like man this feels great and i could slay it and then i got in the room and jason's like why are you tapping your foot like that? I was like, what right. do you mean? He's like, we didn't tell you to feel it in three eighth notes. <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> so I had pra I had in ingrained this. I had put all the notes in the right place, but I had ingrained, I had practiced the feel the wrong way, unknowingly. Right. Right. And that was something that has took me years to sort of tease out of my my playing and it's only now I think that there's still like three or four bars that when we when we play the piece that I have to play it in the way I learned it when I was in grad school right which I know I can do but every time I get up to it I'm just like yep there's 24 year old Josh yeah, yeah. <laughs> working on that sticking completely out of the blue not paying attention to anything else um but for me that process of being really methodical at that point in my life worked and just as a disclaimer i don't have the luxury of 12 hours a day anymore as right. i'm sure you don't either um so how i triage my practice now is a slightly different uh beast but at the time that was how i was able to to get through that particular chunk in my in my studies so at the time um, this question is less, I guess, about the methodology of your practice and just more about the, more of the backstory. Um, you know, you got contacted by, so, and they asked you to do these concerts. Was that at that point, was that just a, like, did you think I am auditioning? This is, this is my opportunity or I'm just filling in right now. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, like, did you have one mindset over the other? Because, I mean, that's a whole lot of work. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when I was still in the group, we made, we made a couple people do that a couple of times. Matthew McClung. Um, Ryan Bishop, Stuart, I think. Yeah, Stuart Gerber. Um, uh -huh. oh, just yeah, just yeah. learn, you know, like that, that same thing. Like, hey, do you want to come play, you know, David Lang, John Cage, like all of this stuff, which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I, I don't know. Did you, when you, when you had that up, was it presented to you as, Hey, would you like to do this? And if you do well, maybe this is a long-term uh, thing the for or... the former, not the latter. It was presented to me as, Hey, do you want to do this? Yeah. Um, with no, there was no, uh, there's, there wasn't, there weren't 10 more words to that statement. <laughs> okay. um, there was no, and... promi there was no promise of anything. No. Yeah. No, but at the time, I mean, now that I'm like 14 years into so, at the time, there wasn't really anything to promise. Like, yeah. 
Sure. They didn't, they didn't know what was happening. Like there was, I remember now, like now I think some of the conversations I remember them talking about them having at that moment was like, should we be a trio? Like, right. is right. this something we want to keep doing? Like, I think the natural inclination that I know now, if somebody decided to bail on the group, that discussion may be a little bit easier because the, we're established as a quartet. We'd have to get all new rep. Like, but at the time, I think there was enough stuff up in the air that I think they, they were legitimately considering some other solutions. But the reality of that time was they had all this quartet rep that they needed to tour. So they presented to me everything on a need to know basis. It was like, we need this. Are, do you know if you can do this? And right. I, think, I think my acceptance of that or the reason I didn't question it is because of my time at the University of Akron, where I had done, I had been sort of trained in a different way than I was at Yale. Yale's not a freelance school. Like you don't go there to learn how to freelance. You go there to get, to really dive in and possibly get a conservatory teaching job or play with an orchestra. But the idea that you would use those skills to be a freelancer is not, was not part of the culture there when I was there. Um, but at Akron, I was constantly playing, you know, subbing with orchestras, playing mostly steel drum gigs, playing congas on various like Christmas events and things like, you know, uh, children's choirs needed a djembe player. Like I was just constantly making $150 here, $200 there, 75 bucks here, just playing with a million different people. So the concept of getting called to do a bunch of gigs was completely normal to me. Like that idea that I would play with a bunch of people I had never met and have the possibility of never seeing them again was not a surprise to me. Like I didn't, it didn't feel weird. Right. So I was like, well, I know how to play with three other people I've never met before. I've done right. that. I did that for five years at Akron. Um, the only difference was, is I'm not learning um, Margaritaville. I'm learning so-called Boston Nature. So the only thing that was different was just the, the stress level of the type of music I was playing. But the actual, actual ecosystem that I was operating in was normal to me. Um, I think there was, a, I think the only time I had that thought of, I think I need to ask if I'm in the group <laughs> was when they asked me to do a recording session. Right. I had done, I had done a gig, uh, in, um, in, I think May after I had graduated, uh, in New York with, so, and then went on a tour of Russia with them in June and I got back and Dan Truman, uh, they were going to record a piece of his called five and a half gardens. And they were like, do you want to be on this recording? And I said, well, does this mean, I think, I, I think my first question was like, well, am I getting like, am I getting paid more? Right. Like, and I, and I remember Adam looking at me and being like, well, do you want to be on the recording? And because I came from a freelance mentality, I was like, well, you paid me to do all these gigs. Right. Um, this is another like four day gig. I mean, I'm not going to do it for free if I don't, I mean, <laughs> what, what do you, I mean, what do you, well, I mean, I, I would be happy to, but, what's the currency here? Like, right. Am I doing it for free with the promise of being considered for this job? And if I'm not, then pay me 200 bucks. Yeah. I'll come in. I'll learn the part right. and I'll go away. Cause that's, right. I'm good at that. You know? Right. Um, luckily things then in July worked out where I had jumped through enough hoops and done, done things at a high enough level and with, with a low enough amount of drama that they asked me to join then in, in July. And, things work out the way they did, but I was not under any, I didn't make any assumptions uh, right. about where this was leading. Um, yeah. You know, my undergrad, Larry Snyder was always like, just be in front of like, be the person people want to be around, be the person who's out there that being seen. And that's was really at that time, my only thought process was like, well, these are guys doing things in the world. I want to be in front of them. And if they ever need a sub again in the future, I hope they call me. Right. Um, well, and you know, uh, Obviously, I mean, all of that can be traced back to, um, and, and I think is a good lesson for people to learn, um, you know, your, obviously your willingness to initially jump into what is just a, an insanely tall order, the, the, the music that you were asked to learn, um, you know, that's extraordinarily different from, hey, will you play with this regional orchestra and you're going to play cymbals on this piece? Okay, cool. You know, like I'll have a couple of symbol practice sessions before the, you know, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to I have 30 days to learn, you know, um, 
well, three hours of, of yeah. rep where I'm not, I'm playing the whole three hours. <laughs> That's right. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And like one of the core pieces is, you know, maybe one of the, one of the harder pieces in, in, you know, our, our repertoire. So, you know, it, it's, and that just might be, well, Hey, I'm Josh Quillen. That's just what I do, man. I just, I, you know, I, I lay the stuff down. Um, obviously it wouldn't have gone to that place had you not, um, taken every single step as seriously as you did with, which of course all goes back to practice and, and preparation. I mean, there's, you know, yeah. Well, and some of it too, I think like, uh, this is something that uh, again, I think I got from Larry Snyder where uh, I remember very, we were doing a recording session and it was the first time that I had ever been in a recording studio. We were, we were recording a Christmas album with the steel band. So it's not, again, it's not like the repertoire was hard, but Larry was like, this costs 400 bucks an hour to be in the room. So we're talking about $3,000 for the day. You're doing a job, like pretend you're bagging groceries. Right. And you've got to make sure the eggs don't break. Like that's all your, like that's your only job. Like don't go in there, don't talk, don't raise your voice, don't question anything. Like right. go in and do what the engineer asks you to do. And it kind of scared me. And then I get in there and I was like, well, that's actually really easy. Like doing my, like I'm good at doing my job. I can do that. Right. And so I just had a lot of it. That's that. And then when Adam handed me all that rep, what I had in my head was Larry just being like, you don't have to question it. You don't have to become invested in where this is going, what it is you're doing. Am I playing it right? Am I, am I impressing them? Like all I have to do is my job. My right. job is to put these notes where they need to go. And is it hard? Yes. But it's when you start to get invested in all the other like, well, what if, and what if right. this, and what if that, where you can start to get inside your head about, well, what if I don't have the right mute for my orchestra audition? What if I don't, oh my God, like, you know, all this stuff. What if, what if it's like, well, I just realized I'm going to treat that those rehearsals was so, and those gigs was so like I treated that Christmas record. Right. Like it's a job. I'm going to go in, I'm going to lay it down as best I can. And if I mess up, I, I absolutely messed up many times, but you know, I took the punches and rolled with them and uh, just treated it like a job. And again, that's, I don't know if that's the healthiest approach for everything, but at that moment, that was the only thing I could control. I couldn't control whether or not they asked me to be in the group. Right. I couldn't control anything other than my, what I brought to the table. Yeah. I, I mean, I do think that's a really important point for, um, I mean, my hope, especially in having these conversations is um, in particular for younger people um, mm -hmm. to, to hear these stories and to see how perhaps, you know, these different versions of, of the way various people have um, approached these moments in their careers, how it might apply to, to them. And, um, you know, essentially you in that, in that moment took a pre-existing structure of work, work ethic, um, practice, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it, and applied it to a thing, you know, you understood very well the how, um, maybe mm -hmm. you didn't understand completely the why at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, I think so many of the, 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 the paths that we potentially walk down or start to walk down, um, you can't ever fully realize what's at the end of that path until you start walking down it, and you have to walk down it well in, in order to you know, to understand what it's going to look like 50 feet ahead or 100 feet ahead. And I do think um, sometimes, um, you know, I, I work with young, young students every day. I think sometimes there, there's a fear mm -hmm. of, of doing that. It would be very easy for anybody to say um, to, uh, to Adam, if they hand you three hours, you know, if he says, here's three hours of music, I want you to learn it. You know, if you have, if you have any, reservation or hesitation about that task at all you'd say you know what i i you know no thanks <laughs> like it sounds cool you guys are great mm -hmm. but no thanks i've got these other things that i'm interested in that's just too much time yeah um and so you, you could have said that um now obviously you probably had some level of interest and yeah that that actually looks pretty cool so i'm i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do that but just the 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 act of saying yeah let's walk Let's walk those 50 feet down the path. I know how to do that. And so I'm going to walk well. Um, and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to look around and, and see where things are at that point. Um, you know, at, at its core, like there's, that's a very complex 
uh, situation that has a lot of moving parts, but at its core, it was, it came down to you preparing and then mm -hmm. you, you walking in and executing and, and just doing your thing. It came, it came from, it had to, it had to be built on this idea of, of, of practice and preparation and, and that sort of thing. It's also, I, um, it also, even though I, I don't want to be, I feel like I'm, I'm not, uh, it's not, it's not a fair analogy to equate it to like steel drum gigging, but I, I think the more I think about it, I, I do think there's a lot of correlation here. Um, it wasn't my first time doing that. Right. So that, or at least think it being on that particular type of path. Right. So when I was at, when I was at the university of Akron, I, I started taking steel drum lessons with Matt Dudak and I walked in and he's like, here's what we're going to do for this entire year. We are going to open up the real book. I played a gig with him and he's like, you're bad at reading chord changes. I was like, I know I am terrible at reading chord changes. So we opened up the real book to page one and we sight read over the course of the year, the entire book. And when we got done with that book, still there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You froze up a little bit. Um, we sight read through the whole book uh, and I got better at it. And then he handed me another book that was like, here's two hours worth of steel drum rep. Now I'm going to call you for, I could only call you for a half an hour steel drum gig before. Here's a, now I can, I'm going to call you for a two hour gig. Learn this book. Right. All right. So I opened up that book. I realized that three quarters of the tunes were way easier than any of the tunes in the real book. So I knew that I could sight read them on the gig. Right. Cause that was easy. Yeah. I had to practice the other quarter that were harder. When I was handed all the rep from so, when I was in grad school, it was the same thing. I, it was a real book that Adam was handing me and saying, here's a three hour gig. I opened it up at the time when I was in school, I was playing third construction in my percussion at, in, in the Yale percussion group. And part, one, a part of the real book that Adam handed to me was third construction. Right. And so I was like, Oh, I'm not going to practice third construction for this. Right. Gig. I know that tune. I can sight read that, that lead sheet, <laughs> right. so to speak yeah. on the gig. And when we got to rehearsal, so that saved me a ton of time. Right. Right. Um, when I got to rehearsal with So, we started playing it. It became clear to them that I knew the piece. So we stopped at letter J where the log drum comes in right. and didn't rehearse the rest of it until we walked on stage in Russia right. for the concert. I had right. never played letter J to the end with those guys right. until the show with people sitting in front of me. But I mean, was I nervous? Yeah, that was a weird, that, that was weird, but it was not the first time I had done that particular thing. Right. I had played Margaritaville without ever rehearsing it with total strangers. So that particular skills, my spidey senses in those environments, like, oh, I recognize this. Like, yeah. I know what this path looks like. Um, so like, yeah, I'm on the same path. I'm just holding a different machete, you know? Right, and right, right. I, I, I know how to deal in this world. Um, and I really do think that that like, just being in the trenches in my undergrad, really playing steel band music of all things, like, actually prepared me more for my time auditioning for and touring with so than almost anything I've done up to right. that, uh, I had done up to that point right so uh, fast forward and um, you've now you know spent over a decade with the group um, mm -hmm. the the work that you guys uh, do and have done um, uh, you know, certainly there's been an evolution of it, probably in terms of, you know, vision of, of where the group is going artistically, um, but also, um, you know, as these things uh, happen, you know, uh, commissions over the years and collaborations with this composer, or that composer. Um, you had this, you know, enormous surge initially in order to sort of, you know, get get your your feet wet with the group and then once in it has there ever been another period that felt a similar way maybe not just for you specifically but but group wide of like guys <laughs> we just got this new project dumped on us or whatever and mm -hmm. we're gonna have like you're gonna get out your your your, your paper and put it on the wall in the so studio and say here yeah. we go day one to thirty as you as you were talking, there were two moments that came to mind. One was more of a, more of the freelance mentality. And one was something that was an experience specific to, I think, working in a group like, so the first one where, uh, 
was when we learned Pleiades to play with you and Doug, I think at Montclair. I had never played it. Like I, I had, most of you had done it in grad school. Um, and so you already knew sort of the way so I was going to play things, how to stick things, like all that, all that jazz. Like you had played clavier, you knew that the unison at the end of clavier was like, was a deal, you know, like all of those things. And you're all, and it started coming at me and I was like, I, I've never even played this piece. I don't even know what clavier looks like, you know, right, right. I don't know what six in are. Like I've right. never played six and, you know, um, so when I got that score, uh, that was very specifically like put the paper up. I just got to learn this. Like right. this is a gig I'm getting asked to do it. This is a new lead sheet I have to learn. I don't get to work. I don't have a say in this. I don't have creative input. Not that no one would have listened to me, but it's like, I don't, my job here is not to critique. It's to do my job in the recording studio and then walk away, you know? Right. So then I could just be nuts and bolts and learn. And that was, that was, um, I mean, it was like a very, as I'm thinking about it, it was a very dark time in my life because my dad died Yeah. and I'm in a studio. I was living in Philadelphia. So I'm at this studio learning, learning like Mateau and playing six in while like going to my dad's funeral. It was like, it was a really hectic time, but right. Not to say that to be dark, but again, being organized and having this really objective rubric through which I'm running everything actually helped me, again, stay sane in that incredibly turbulent life thing. Because this is the, you hear the, you hear the phrase all the time, it's like, you'll have more time, you don't have, you'll never have more time than you do now in school. Life gets crazy. Right. And many things in life are way easier than they are in school, but um it's totally true. Like I, I had realities in life that were taking me away for the right reasons, for family reasons, for love, for all the things that you, know, you have kids, like there's things that take you away that actually now I'm really grateful for having been had, had to deal with that in a, in a safe environment like grad school where I, there weren't any real repercussions, you know, now right. there are repercussions. So with Sinakis, that was, that was how I dealt with that. It was very similar to the way I joined. So, the other moment that was more specific to the way I think so operates was commissioning it as time by Steve Mackey. Yes. It, I was playing an instrument that I knew really well that I felt comfortable on, but Steve was writing a lot of really hard music for that instrument that I had never had to play before in that style. Um, there was a microtonal steel drum in the mix now and blah, blah, blah. But the music wasn't handed to me as a 30 minute document that I had to learn front to back in 30 right. days it was handed to me two pages at a time over the right. course of six months so and things were changing all the time i had learned something and steve would like hand me the an update and it would be like it's like crap I, I spent an hour learning that thing and now he only yeah. kept like a like half of it so right. um but i was learning things slowly so i could digest things a little more at my own pace i there wasn't like a gun held in my head to like get this thing done by this certain date um and you could have a little bit more creative input. You could suggest things to the composer. You could like, you know, there were ways to, it just felt a little more organic. Um, but I was living in Philadelphia too at that time. Cause I think Zanakis and that moment Zanakis and it is time kind of happened not so far from each other. I think Steve's piece was like 2010 or 11. And I think Zanakis was maybe 08, 09, somewhere around there. Right. Um, but I was living in Philadelphia and commuting a lot. So I couldn't just whip out my double seconds on the bus. Right. So I had to sit with the score and um, kind of visualize my pants for two seconds and like very like plunk it out in my head and be like, oh, this is going to be a tricky thing. I need to do a double right here, write that in the score. Like I learned most of that piece away from the instrument. Right. And then because I knew when I got on the instrument, the instrument wasn't going to be my problem. It was the music. So I, you there, buddy? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, again, knowing myself, I knew I didn't have to learn everything on the instrument because I knew how to make a good sound. I knew how to get around, um, but I needed to learn Steve's music. And so that, I had to triage that in a little different way than I, than I had to say for Zanakis. Right. Um, and again, I like, I, as I say that, I think back to Larry Snyder again, he, for one semester as part of my lessons, there are these Michael Udall um, 
they're little uh, multiple solos. Yeah. I think they're just called contemporary percussion solos or something like that. Right. And it's like two toms, the wood block and a cowbell or a triangle, a wood block and a kick drum. It's like these little weird setups and the music's not hard. Um, they're just tricky enough that you can basically sight read them. They're, they're not hard, but Larry would be like next week, learn, you know, etude number one, you're not allowed to play on any instruments. I will choose your instruments when you come into the lesson. I will have your setup set up. Here's the way I'm gonna set it up. Here's the picture of it. And he would make me paste it, you know, put the, you know, tape it on the wall. And I would, and he had this thing where he would talk about like, you know, you, you have to stand at the wall, look at the music and air drum. Pretend right. you're like, learning without the instruments. And I had to do that for like, we didn't do the whole book. I think I did like five or six of them. And at the time I thought like, this is really stupid. Why are we, you know, I'm not developing my snare drum role and I'm not like, you know, I'm not learning how to lift off the tom tom, like all the things that we all like want to think about when we're dealing with, with drums and the analog and stuff in our, in our gear. But I walked in and the first time it was really hard. It felt weird because I didn't know what sounds I was about to hear. And then the second time it was a little easier and the third time it was a little easier. And then I was like, Oh, this is, I mean, I can learn marimba solos that way and I can learn, uh, steel drum stuff that way and fast forward you know seven years here I am on the bolt bus from Philadelphia to New York right. doing that very thing um, just in the real world by with a piece uh, by Steve Mackey that was going to get premiered at Carnegie Hall like the right. stakes were much higher but again I'm on a path I've been on before I just have a different machete in my hand and right. I know I know where this path leads and I know how to get through the obstacles that are in front of me because I've done it. I did it five or six times before. Right. Um, so I think I'm fortunate that I had a teacher that sort of forced me to do those things in situations where there were very, it's like high risk, low consequences. Like right. the risk for failure in those moments are very high, but the consequences are low. Now I'm in a high risk, high consequence world where the risk is the same, but I'm used to it now. So I'm not as scared of the consequences anymore. Right. Um, because I know how to deal with it. I'm not worried about losing a gig because I totally walked on stage and didn't know what I was doing. Like, um, I had at bats. I mean, Doug, I remember Doug, like Doug Perkins talked about this all the time. Like you just need more at bats. And, um, I had had plenty of those before I got to the baseball stadium, you know? Um, right, right. and had, I was, I, you know, what's the, uh, I've been using this phrase a lot. Mike, Mike Tyson has a great quote, like everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Like, <laughs> like I had had teachers, including Bob in many respects, um, put me in a situation where I had somebody like a real punch to the face where I had to deal with something I hadn't thought of before. I had to right. be disoriented in a way that was like, Whoa, I haven't, Oh my God. Like I hadn't thought about that before. Um, so when I jumped on stage with so to play third construction, I already knew what that pain felt like. Um, so I wasn't going to be surprised when I got hit in the face. Right. Um, and I think that's something that, that a lot of students don't know that they lack right. when they're students. Yeah. As someone who is, um, whose bulk of, of um, creative activity or, or, you know, your performance profile is, is largely attached um, to a chamber group, mm -hmm. um, you have, you know, kind of this unique, uh, scenario, um, if we're kind of walking this back directly to practice, of um, perhaps observing and um, living alongside, uh, in your case, three other professionals who also have to uh, practice and prepare mm -hmm. for the work you guys do. Is there anything about um, your colleagues' practice and preparation that either one inspires you? or two frustrates you? Uh, well, that's a good question. I would say that I, the thing I'm trying to get better at as an adult is being okay with my weaknesses and right. trying to figure out a way to use my weaknesses as a, like exploit them in the right ways. Um, and also avoid them in the right ways. Like right. there's some things in my cake that are already baked in and I can't, you know, I can, I could decide to go, like, I could decide to unbake the fact that I have a shitty snare drum roll. <laughs> but right now, the world doesn't require me to have one. So 
I'm going to use my time trying to get to know my wife a little bit better out to dinner, like, right. you know, or go see a movie, like whether other people can say that's the wrong decision, but I'm not taking orchestra auditions. Right. I'm playing bum, 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 <laughs> you know, in mallet quartet. Yeah. So I have to work on other things. Um, the thing that for me, I, tr I will say the thing I try to practice on a regular basis before we get to our colleagues is sight reading. Okay. I try to sight read a lot when I get the chance. And actually, if I'm in the studio, like rather than going and learning notes on something, I will just throw up like some etude, crash through it, totally crap all over it, and then move on. Like right. not even think about it. And just take 30, you know, 30 seconds to read through a Bach cello, you know, one movement from a Bach cello suite by myself, knowing it's terrible. Right. Just as a like, yep, that's where I still am with sight reading. <laughs> and just as a like, I know where I need to work on things. Um, the things about my colleagues that I've noticed, um, that are, that are things that are inspiring. And I think frustrating too, for me, are, like Jason is a good example. Jason, Jason is really good in the moment on stage playing in such a way that uh, I don't want to, yeah, playing in a style. Like if he hits a roadblock and something is about to go awry, he is really good at playing in the style of the composer in such a way that you don't know if he's playing right or wrong notes. Right. Um, that doesn't mean he doesn't practice, but the thing that he's good at is letting things go in the moment, even when he's practicing, like right. try, fit, he starts big picture and works down to the minutia. Right. And I like, I think I start big picture, but as soon as the minutia gets in the room, I get freaked out and I, it's very clear that Josh Quillen is playing now, not <laughs> Josh, not Josh Quillen in the style of David Lang. Right. Um, and it's not that I don't know David's music. It's just, I get in my head and I start to freeze up. I'm jealous of that. And it makes me mad because we're in a room and, and if a composer's there and if I crap all over something, the composer looks at me and I look across <laughs> and I know Jason's leaving out three quarters of the notes the composer wrote, but it feels awesome, you know? And, and uh, it's really frustrating that, 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 that bothers me, but it's, it doesn't like, that doesn't bother me about Jason. It's just, I wish that I could triage in the moment. Like he's an excellent ER doctor. Right. When right. it comes to live performance in the moment, and even in front of, even in a workshop scenario right. of leaving out, nine of the the 20 notes to make it feel great um and then adding them in as he gets comfortable i try to cram everything in at the beginning and uh for me that's that's the biggest thing adam is a very adam's very good at memorizing stuff mm -hmm. so so is jason um like he's memorized adam is memorizing string of pearls or did a while ago and is relearning it for a performance and it's like i look at that and i'm just like i want the, the thing that comes to my head is like, you'll never get that time back. I know. I know. It's gone. It's gone, dog. Like, <laughs> yeah, like you are, you are choosing to put this many hours mm -hmm. into putting those notes in your head. Like that is, that's a choice you're making. Right. And, but it's a choice, like for him, he plays better that right. way. Right. And I, I think the thing I've learned, even though I'm jealous of that, because there are some instances where we do need to memorize some things and like, and I have to work way harder at memorizing things than I think, you know, Adam or Jason or Eric necessarily need to. Um, so I have to cheat sheet things a lot before I get to a memorization stage. Um, right. I still have cheat sheets up for third construction. I look at them way less now than I used to, but I still, there's like, there's like eight bars in that piece that I'm just like, oh my God, why can I not figure right. this out? Right. Um, you know, so for me, that's tr learning from my bandmates. Like the thing I learned from Jason is I'm, I'm trying to get better at in the moment, thinking bigger picture. Um, and in the way that, uh, in just as a process from the beginning of your practice, like, we often come in and we look at like something like I did with so-called laws in the beginning. Like I went through and played every note right where it needs to go. Actually, I wonder how I would play it differently now if at the time I had just set the tempo at wherever I needed to go and played 16th notes and just stayed right. in the right bar, right. looked ahead three bars and got as many of those notes as I could get and then just got better at that skill. 
Right. Would I play the piece any differently? Would I be playing more of the right notes than I am now? I don't know. Yeah. But that's something I, I feel like when I look at Jason and the way he processes music um, from the beginning, that's something that inspires me, but also frustrates me because I don't, I don't look at the world that way. Right. Um, I don't look, it's hard for me to look at, you know, politics that way. It's hard for me to look at the, uh, you know, the environmental global warming, like all of it to me, like I end up getting caught in the weeds real quick. Yeah. And I think uh, for somebody like Jason, that, that for me, that to answer your question, that particular way of Jason processing things is both inspiring and maddening for me yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I certainly hear that. I think there's, um, there's similarities um, me with, with uh, you or the way you've explained the way you work and, and um, uh, Doug with uh, maybe a similar, similar uh, approach that, that Jay has and the Doug is very big picture. And, mm -hmm. and um, I, I mean, I'm happy to just live in the weeds, you know, like never come out of the weeds. <laughs> like I'll just sit here. It's fine. Um, and yeah. you know, Doug wants to get a view of the, of the whole field. Yeah. Um, way earlier than than i would ever uh, want to um mm -hmm. but you know it, as as you've said i mean i think um a combination of those of those two viewpoints is is is, is really wonderful and it 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 challenges us um but but hopefully in the same way the way you work maybe the way i work hopefully also challenges jason or or doug you know to like come on over, you know, let's, let's, you know, these four <laughs> well, notes are really important. Let's, let's actually get these really right. You know? Yeah. Um, well, and, and I would say though, something that's, that's gotten into So's process. Um, we do a lot more group sight reading now than we mm. ever had to. Like we're, we're reading new pieces, like at Soci every year, we, we've gotten into the habit of reading new pieces. Uh, we do a composer residency at, residency at Princeton or at Columbia or something. And we're, we're, we have 12 pieces and we've got three hours to get workshop them and get through them all with the composers. So you just have to crash through a 10 minute piece and you don't have time to be in the weeds. And yeah. um, we have, I think as a group gotten way better at that and it's helped me as a performer. And I think part of it, sight reading, um, I don't want to say you don't get invested in a piece because I, I do care about a composer wanting, I do care about giving them the best representation of what it is their vision, what they think their vision has been up to that point. So I don't want to say that I'm not invested in the piece or that I don't care, but in the moment that I'm playing their piece, I have zero emotional investment in any of the notes that are going by me at that moment. My job is to try to give them a, 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 a run through that if they squint at it, it sounds and looks like their piece. Right. Then on the second pass, we can get a little bit more in the deep, in the weeds about stuff. And then the fourth and the, to, you know, that way, by the time you get to the show, you're still triaging some stuff, but you've dealt with enough where it's representative and it's at a high enough level where everybody can sleep at night um, with the product. And that, that has helped me on my own personal playing. That's helped me in the way that we deal with. It's helped me when we workshop pieces that we are going to be super invested in in a long time, like a new piece by Julie Wolf or a concerto by David Lang. They're still like you, they still hand you a piece of music and you've got three pages and you, you can't obsess about stuff when it's handed to you and they want to hear something, right? You know, you've got to give them the best representation you can. So that particular practice, again, sight reading has helped me become a little less obsessed about every weed that goes by and try to see the bigger picture quicker. Right. Um, okay. So uh, kind of final wrapping up question. We've talked about um, sort of beginning stages of your, of your professional life and what set you up for that. And, um, and maybe some more recent um, uh scenarios, projects, pieces with so and how you've handled them. Um, what's, what's coming up in the future that you're, um, that maybe you're particularly excited about? Um, uh, not specifically just from a project standpoint, but what are you, what's coming up that you are most excited about practicing? If anything, and you could say actually yeah, no. nothing, Todd. <laughs> Uh, I would say that we're, we, you are going to be performing with us at Carnegie Hall on December 7th. 
Um, we're doing, so it's called, I think, Century of Percussion, where we're sort of doing a, ret uh, a retrospective of a broad swath of the percussion repertoire. Um, and there's some pieces in there that I've played, but haven't played the particular part that I'm playing, like on ionization, I'm playing a new part. So, you know, do I need to shed it for hours? No, it's not a particularly hard piece of music, but I have to, I have to practice and learn and how to hear some things I haven't had to pay attention to yet. Um, I'm curious about that how that process is going to go. We're playing a new piece by Joanna Beyer that I've never played. Uh, So's never, we did it at Sosi a couple of years ago, but I've never played it. Um, there's a piece by Julia Wolf that we premiered and played a handful of times, but I'm still basically learning it. Like there's things I play wrong every time we do it that I need, to, I need to, I know that by December 7th, I'm still not going to have a hundred percent of it totally locked down, but right. I need to practice. There's, there's like my goal, there's like four bars that, if by December 7th, I can play in my sleep, I'll walk off stage being like, yeah, right, right. feel great. Yeah. Um, we're playing play uh, Poe with you all. Like, it's not something, uh, there's parts of that that I need to practice. Right. Um, and there's other parts of it I know when you all in the room, I maybe won't play perfectly, but I'll right. get better at in the room. Um, so there's that that I'm, I'm, I'm psyched to get ready for. The other thing that's unique, I think, right now to so that I'm curious, that I'm in interested in is the four of us and with Shelby, um, our operations manager, Shelby Blesinger McKay, we're going to Trinidad in mm. February. And uh, the other, th we're all going to be playing with this band called the Skiffle Bunch Steel Orchestra. And the arranger, there's three arrangers, one of which is Kendall Williams, who is a former student of mine. He's currently a doctoral student at Princeton in composition. And the other three guys are going to be playing steel drums for the first time in that context. So they're going to be practicing not just an instrument they've never really, they played like once or twice before, but not in this way. And they're right. playing a, a, a piece of music that's 10 minutes of a lot of notes. Right. Um, so we're going to be practicing a panorama tune together, like yeah. something that has nothing to do. It's like, it's not Steve Reich's drumming. It's not Poe. Like, right that process is going to be interesting to see how that goes. Um, I am going to be doing what's called drilling down there for Kendall and Mark, Mark Brooks and Odie Franklin, who are the, the three co-arrangers, like, which means like they arrange the tune, they write the tune, they translate the music to the orchestra, but then Kendall's going to give me a score. I have to learn the score. Like score study is something that I've, like I'm, I'm not a conductor. I don't right. need to know what the oboe part is necessarily in the orchestra. I got to know my triangle part, but now I'm not a conductor, but I'm in charge of making sure things come out of the music in the way they need to do, go. So I have to study this panorama score in a way that if I'm standing in front of this 140 piece steel band, I can hear when the guitar section needs to lean forward on their time or when we need to change up a part in the cellos and put it on the quads because right. the quads are in front you know those sorts of decisions are things that I have to practice ahead of time all the different scenarios so that I know what answers are possible when I get in the room it's a different I'm not like learning a note like right. I could sight read the, I could probably sight read the panorama well enough to be okay with it. So I'm not right. going to have to sit down and practice every note like the other three guys might have to. But what I need to practice is like, I need to practice hearing that score and identifying where, what needs to happen when. Um, right. And that's something that, that's a skill set that I've done a few times, but it's not something I do on a regular basis. So I'm going to have to sit with a pencil and be like, I know steel bands enough. I know what this or steel orchestra sounds like. I'm going to have to do the score study and circle chunks of the score and be like, I'll bet based on what I'm seeing here on the print, I'll bet this is going to be a trouble spot. Keep an eye out for this. Right. I have to do that with 40 pages of a 10 minute long score. That's a type of practice. It's just not a like, like snare drum roll style practice, right. you know, right. or putting a C sharp in the right spot. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I mean, it's, it's something that, I don't get to do as often as I'd like, but I'm, it's something that, I mean, I, I think Ivan was talking about sometimes you don't, you're not super psyched about practicing right. all the time. Like you right. just, it's like taking your medicine, but that particular type of practice, I'm really, really excited about because um, I, don't, I don't know why I take really great joy and pleasure from working with steel bands like right. that in that context. And I'm really excited about that coming up. Yeah. Um, 
Great. I think that's a that's a, a great place to to kind of wrap. I think it, it kind of you know what's been interesting through now five of these um, mm -hmm. interviews and chats is, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of similarities with. Um, well, I've interviewed I've interviewed people that are more or less all sort of in a similar um, at a similar point uh, in their careers. I guess Nancy's been doing this a little bit longer than than the rest of us, but. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's certainly similarities with the limitations that we all perhaps experience with time um, and availability of practice um, and just kind of how how that general approach is. But um, the very specific approaches, what's fascinating is is um, how distinct they are. Um, mm. Like this, hearing you talk for. Um, the other funny thing is that every single one of these that I've done has gotten longer and, and you have, you've come through with that buddy. Uh, cause I think Ivan's was 35 minutes and we're probably, you know, rocking close to 45. Um, <laughs> but to hear you right on the heels of Ivan, just how distinct a, a, um, sometimes a, a, maybe not a practice approach, but just like the, um, the mental frameworks that you guys, have that you use to sort of put on on these individual problems of this piece mm. or this project or whatever um, for me is just fascinating it's all really really useful it's um, uh, I'm I get to be the the one you know common thread in terms of people that go throughout all these interviews so I can say like oh yeah I totally hear you you know I do that too or yeah, yeah and I do that too I can say that about every single person um, but yet all of these things are different. And so it's, it's sort of this web that, that um, is in the end kind of created with how it's all connected, yet, yet people are still sort of in different areas with it. Um, and so I think, I, I think one important thing that I think the older I get, just to sort of toss this in at the end here, like the thing that I think is important about that I didn't process well early on in my studies about practicing is I compared myself to what everybody else was doing. And I think now that I'm 40, I certainly have not figured it, everything out. In fact, I figured hardly anything out the more I think about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, the world is not a fair place. The fact that Jihei Jung can do what she does, there's no, it's not fair that she can learn pieces the way, or Gwen, like, you know, right. Gwen Thrasher, when I was in school, like, Gwen would you, like, I never heard her hit a wrong note. I've never heard you hit a wrong note. Like there are things that some people can do way better. Um, some people have peanut allergies. Some people are sensitive <laughs> to the sun, you know, like there are things that, and I think practicing and people, the way people absorb information is also nobody's the same. So try to be self-critical about or and observe about yourself, what it is that you do well and what it is you don't do well. If what you don't do well is manage your time, and I think this like your, I mean, I joke on the podcast about your, your liquid drum journal, but it's like your practice journal. But if you don't manage your time well, then say that out loud, say to yourself, do you want to learn to manage your time well? Right. And if the answer to that is no, then okay. Right. But if the answer is yes, then figure that out about yourself. Right. Um, I learned that I didn't manage my practice time well if I didn't have something visual there to keep me on track. I can't keep things in my head like that. Never have been able to. Yeah. Other people can. Jihei maybe can. And right. she doesn't need to spend as much time on marimba as I do. And learning that and being okay with that and not seeing that as a, as a downside, but seeing it as a, a tool to sort of make you be the best version of yourself. Right. Um, I think is the healthiest approach. And that may mean that you have to practice eight hours a day, right? Every day of your life for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and that may be the case, but for somebody else, it may mean they only have to like Jason, it doesn't take him as long to learn drum set stuff. When I have to play drum set, ugh, I have to right. practice for hours and it's maddening, you know? Right, right. So, you know, I, I think not comparing yourself to what other people are doing and just, trying to see why it is they're doing the things they're doing and, and what tools they're using is probably more beneficial than just being like, well, Jihei practices eight hours a day. Maybe I have to like, right. That's, that's not going to do anybody any good. Right. That's beautiful. And that's, that's, yes, that is, that is actually exactly my, my hope too, that these conversations that, that, you know, 
a younger person can hear exactly what you just said and 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 maybe have an aha moment about like right it's not it's not about the number four or six or eight hours of any given thing in particular you know it's like it it's um it is very individualized um but i think also takes a great deal of honesty and like you said self-realization to just be to take an objective view and say you know what do i want where, where am i trying to go and and how long does it take me to get there and in what way do i need to you know yes mm -hmm. do i do i need the journal or can i keep it all in my head is it more organic for me is it more, more intuitive or whatever um and uh that you know it's that's that realization which i'm also you know only now starting to have as a 42 year old um well and what worked and what worked for me in school like there may be or there may be something that worked for me in grad school that was or that didn't work for me in grad school that i was like well this will never work right but never throw anything away like right. like keep it there because now that i'm 42 it's like oh Right. Now this other thing may actually work yeah. better for me because I see the world differently. I'm a, I am not, I think the only thing, it's like what is the human, every cell in your body is recycled. So I'm right. literally not the same person right. down to the cellular level that I was 20 years ago. Right. So to expect that every other way I operated 20 years ago is even going to, like it's just physically, scientifically not a reality. So never throw anything away. You never know when you're going to need it and don't be afraid to pull pull them out and then put them back when you're done, you know? Right, right. And on that note, Josh Quillen, we're gonna, we're gonna shut this puppy down. I, I don't wanna eclipse that hour mark because, you know, that's, for me, I, I don't know, I wanna save that for, that'll be a, maybe. Our podcast. All right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, Todd, it's been a pleasure uh, having a truce with you. Um, as soon as we hang up, truce is over. And, that's right. Um, and I'll go back to being the heel of uh, <laughs> the contemporary percussion world. But uh, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. And um, for anybody that, li you know, is, has listened to this or watched this and has any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. If you, it's just josh at sopercussion.com. Uh, and I should say very few people actually do reach out. So if you do want to, don't hesitate. Um, if there's any other details people want to tease out. Okay, everybody listening, Josh needs friends, all right? So yep. uh, send him a note.